Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. One summer morning, Queen Lenshina Malenga headed to morning service for her followers. The Lumpa Church had moved away from civilization to be safe from fanatic attacks and focus on their retreat from the evils of humankind. But the years of tension that had built between the church and national authorities was about to catch up to her. That morning, as she approached the cathedral, she heard something in the distance. She was taken away and forced to hide from her congregation, forced to witness, as hundreds of her loyal and devoted followers were brutally slaughtered by the enemies of her past. Forced to watch as the religion she had built from the ground up was effectively destroyed. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we bring you the second half of our dive into the Lumpa Church in Zambia during the middle of the last century and the life and deeds of its prophet and founder, Queen Lenshina Mulenga. We're going to see how the Lumpa Church went from being the most powerful religious organization in the country to becoming an enemy of the state and the target of one of the biggest massacres in Zambia's history. It would eventually end up forgotten as a footnote in their history books. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. A lot of you have asked how you can help support the show. And if you enjoy the podcast, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at ParCast and on Twitter at ParCast Network. By 1960, the Lumpa Church was without a doubt the biggest and most influential religious organization in Zambia. Its followers amounted to almost 200,000 people, more than any other church in that region, including the Catholic missionaries that had colonized that area decades before. The head of the church was Lenshina Molenga, known to her followers as Queen Alice. Lenshina was born an ordinary woman in one of the lower clans of the Bemba tribes in Africa and had garnered tremendous support and following after she fell into a coma and received a religious vision. As we discussed last episode, in this vision, Jesus Christ and a group of angels appeared to her and told her that the only way to save humankind was to steer them away from the corruption and evil of modern religion and witchcraft and go back to traditional African roots and rituals. After being expelled from the Presbyterian Church for trying to spread this ideology among churchgoers, Lenshina founded the Lumpa Church, and within a couple of years, it had become a bigger and more powerful organization than both the local Christian churches and the government. This quick ascent to power became a threat for the authorities around her. Just five years after the foundation of the church in 1955, the Lumpa Church had flourished outside its main site in the Chinsali district and expanded to other areas within and even outside Zambia, such as Lusaka, Copper Belt, Kabwe, Livingstone, and Zimbabwe. And although the group started off exclusively within the Bemba people, it grew beyond cultural and national boundaries by bringing in converts from other religions and tribes. The church was at its peak of popularity at the beginning of the 1960s. In those days, around a thousand converts would walk from all over Africa to the many Lumpen temples, in particular the main cathedral, the Sione in Chinsali, to attend the services and to hand over charms, amulets, and totems. Pilgrims and villages would pay a small fee for the cleansing of their soul and belongings. Lenshina's close associates collected this contribution from them, which allegedly was an essential part in absolving themselves from the influence of witchcraft. But as Lenshina's power and influence grew with no apparent end, so did other groups' distrust and disdain of them. The missionaries and tribe chiefs tried to fight against her and her followers with little success, as their own local influence had been quickly diminishing over the years. But there was another group whose power had grown alongside Lenshina's, although perhaps not with the same impetus. It was a group that shared the same political ideals that the Lumpa Church had acquired, and the group that would also bring the church to a violent downfall. 
Before we get into the specifics of how this political group fought against Lenchina and brought down the Lumpa Church, it's important to understand exactly who they were and how they got to that position. For that, we need to paint a picture of Zambia's political landscape in the middle of the 20th century. The arrival of foreigners and exploitation of the Zambian region in Africa goes all the way back to the 1700s when the first Portuguese settlers arrived. But it wasn't until the 1870s that British expansion forces reached the area. It officially became part of the British South Africa Company in 1889, a subgroup of the administration in England that looked over their territories. Their involvement with the locals was mainly to exploit their land for minerals, with little involvement in their politics or society. By this point, they still allowed locals to control their own government. In 1924, the administration of the region, which was known at the time as Northern Rhodesia, passed under direct control of the British government, and the area became a proper colony, taking over their politics and society. They brought in thousands of missionaries to educate and convert them to Christianity. England ruled over this region with white supremacy values, like it did with every other colony. By the 1950s, as the British Empire was quickly losing its global influence and outreach, the political future of all of its colonies came under discussion. It was assumed that the southern region of the colony, which was mostly white, would integrate northern Rhodesia and they would become a single independent nation. However, the locals had other plans. Black opposition in the northern area was strong, and they demanded a political voice. They did not want to be assimilated into a mostly white and European culture. In 1953, the British government allowed the region to become a self-governing colony with its own assembly, known as the Federation of Rhodesia. The people in charge were still almost entirely of European descent, and there were no African voices present in the government. This mobilized the African people to create their own political parties in an attempt to win seats in the assembly. The first political party in Africa was the African National Congress, or ANC for short, which was formed back in the 1940s, but gained more traction and influence as the government allowed the native people to become more involved in government. Northern Rhodesia only had two seat members in their National Assembly in 1953, both belonging to the ANC. Younger members of the party started to deem the tactics of the ANC as too tame and old-fashioned for a generation that craved independence. For anyone who has followed the arc of revolution, this is actually to be somewhat expected. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here. Remember, she's not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for the show. According to author and international speaker Dr. Tim Elmore, there's a reason that younger generations tend to radicalize in the face of political movements, whether it's as progressive as participating in elections or as negative as joining terrorist organizations. Moments of political turmoil provide the opportunity for young people to invest in something larger than themselves and possibly become someone important. They're also most likely to be contrarians, rebelling against the status quo perpetuated by older generations. This is largely why baby boomers were seen as extremists during the 60s, but are largely considered conservative by many younger liberal activists today. It's part of the natural cycle of sociopolitics. In 1958, a group of eager, radical young people broke off from the ANC to found a new party, the United National Independence Party, or UNIP. Their political strategies were based on civil disobedience. They would often undermine the authority of both colonial government and tribal chiefs by openly mocking, criticizing, and intimidating them. They promised people that if they joined their party, they would become as wealthy as the Europeans that had been oppressing them for years, with no clear explanation as of how this would happen. The natives didn't seem to mind, though. Support for the UNIP grew quickly, just as support for the Lumpid Church was increasing as well. By the mid-1950s, Lenchina had already founded the religion, as well as established the main cathedral in Chinsali, and had started to expand to other areas in the country. It's not a coincidence that both of these groups gained such large support at the same time. After all, both of their core ideologies were based on the refusal of colonial authorities. Even though one focused strictly on religion and the other on politics, their followers usually overlapped. 
Two years later, the UNIP had gained three more seats in the assembly. This continued steadily through the years, and by the end of the decade, they made up more than half of the assembly. The UNIP had become one of the most powerful up-and-coming revolutionary groups in the nation, rivaled perhaps only by the Lumpa Church. One man in particular was aware of this, a man who had his eyes set on making himself the ultimate authority in the country and saw the church as a threat for his political goals. His name was Kenneth Kaunda. Kenneth Kaunda was the founder and first president of the UNIP. He led the movement in 1958 to break off from the ANC and create a new party with more radical and proactive tactics to achieve independence. Even though the UNIP could not fall under the category of a cult, Kenneth did share some traits with the common profile of a cult leader. He and Lenchina were much more similar than either of them ever cared to admit. Much like the Lumpa Church, the UNIP had an enormous number of dedicated, loyal, and passionate followers willing to go to great lengths for the ideologies of their organization. The Lumpa Church started off as a group whose sole focus was their strong, charismatic leader. The UNIP, however, quickly disguised their authoritarian structure behind sweeping political goals in an effort to seem like a more nationalist party. Kenneth Kaunda became the face of the UNIP party from the very start and centered the narrative of Zambian independence around his own ascent to power. He and the members of his party fought hard to gain the support of the people, although that usually meant using intimidation tactics like threats and physical violence. Slowly but surely, he gained seats in the assembly and thus political influence in the country. At the same time that this struggle between the established assembly and the rising revolutionary groups was taking place, Lenchina kept mostly to herself politically and engaged in very few struggles against the government personally, if any at all. As we've discussed before, it was the members of the Lumpa Church that would begin to use the organization toward political ends, and Lenchina had very little to do with it. But even though she had no affinity for politics, she usually stood behind her followers when they got into political trouble. For example, on one occasion, one of her supporters was arrested for calling a Roman Catholic priest a witch, and Lenchina went to the district commissioner's office and asked him to detain her alongside him in a show of solidarity. But for the most part, Lenchina was always trying to avoid direct confrontation with the authorities, and would probably have not gone against a UNIP-led government either, if they hadn't gone after her first. Our story will continue in a moment, right after the break. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. Hi there, I'm hosting a brand new show on Parcast called Mythology. It dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. I've already listened to part one, and I can't wait for part two. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's part one on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. Now the story continues. Kenneth Kaunda was deeply aware of the enormous influence that Lenchina Mulenga and the Lumpa Church held within the Zambian people. Just as his party was beginning to gain political traction starting in 1958, the Lumpa Church had expanded to even the most remote corners of the country, bringing in hundreds of new converts every week. His party knew that the Lumpa Church was perhaps the biggest obstacle for Zambian independence, but Kaunda saw it mostly as a threat to his own growing authority. 
The UNIP was fighting for a government that would bring one nation united under one church, one party, and one leader. Kaunda was fighting to establish the seeds of an authoritarian government, and allowing Lenshina to keep the enormous power she had would have meant a government divided by church and state. Just like the Christian missionaries had attempted to do years before, Kaunda started an active campaign against the Lumpa Church in an attempt to strip it of its power. However, unlike the Christian church, his influence was growing steadily, and avid members of the UNIP started to listen and act accordingly. Kaunda began to include direct attacks against Lenchina and the Lumpa Church in his speeches during political rallies. He was mostly reusing past arguments that the missionaries had already made against her, like her devious political ambitions, and that she was planning a holy war against the state. One of the most effective tactics that the UNIP used was provocation and intimidation through incendiary comments. They elevated the claims that Christian missionaries had previously said of Lenchina, saying things like Lenchina was a mad cultist who forced her followers to drink urine. These attacks against the Lumpa Church led to constant harassment of its followers by members of the UNIP party. They started as mostly verbal attacks that escalated to physical attacks after services and eventually led to the UNIP setting some local Lumpa buildings on fire. The attacks went on for years. From 1961 to 1963, Lenchina would constantly go to the now UNIP-controlled government to ask for protection for her members. These pleas were never answered. So when the harassment not only didn't stop, but became worse with time, Lenchina made a radical decision to protect her church. At the end of 1963, she decided to move her people out of the villages and establish their own settlements away from the escalating violence. Lenchina decided to leave the villages to completely withdraw from an even more corrupt society that, according to her, had been taken over by Satan and would soon be destroyed by God. Although in a more practical sense, she wanted to avoid confrontation with a group that clearly did not want her there. It was never her intention to create war with the UNIP. In her desire to escape from the violent attacks of the UNIP, but also to establish the social, political, and religious isolation that the Lumpa Church had always been aiming for, Lenchina and her followers established settlements outside of the regions of Chinsali, Kasama, Mpika, Isoka, and Lundasi. Lenchina moved to the large Sione, the main cathedral of the Lumpa Church, that was built outside of her home district. They built up stockades around them and made outside access very difficult. All of this was made without permission of either the assembly or the Chiti Mukulu, the paramount chief of the local tribes. On top of this, Lenchina refused to let the Lumpa Church pay taxes to the government. She had felt that she had not received their support when she asked for protection from the UNIP, so she would not give them hers. By 1964, the fight for Zambian independence had almost come to an end. The UNIP had won enough seats to become the controlling majority. It had slowly taken over the government, with Kenneth Kaunda at its head. At the same time, European involvement in most of the African colonies had stopped almost completely. Ever since the end of World War II decades earlier, European countries found themselves in tremendous debt and could no longer afford the resources necessary to keep control of the colonies. In addition, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill made a post-war agreement, which stated that all nations should be able to choose their own form of government. After a decade of pushing, the dam broke. Zambia was declared an independent state in 1964. As happened with almost every other African colony, it was done mostly through negotiations. No casualties came from this. Kenneth Kaunda became Zambia's first prime minister. Even though Zambia structurally never turned into an authoritarian state, the same party with the same man at its head stayed in control for over three decades after its independence. Kaunda's policies and his reliance on a powerful regime were reminiscent of dictators in other African regions at the time. Uganda, Equatorial Guinea, and the Central African Republic 
fell under similarly structured authoritarian regimes. On his research on African personal dictatorships, scholar Samuel DeCallo notes that most African nations were left with broken and corrupt government systems, and that the frustration of their leaders over not being able to fix or change them led to a rise of authoritarian policies. DeCallo also notes that even before the arrival of British colonizers, many African tribes already followed a patriarchal, hierarchical system, since many of the leaders in these nations had native origins, it was a structure that was familiar and understandable to them. Just like Lenchina reflected the matriarchal origins of her tribe in her church, Kaunda enforced the authoritarian roots of his. As Kaunda took over Zambia's government, he started to resemble what Dikalo calls a personalist dictator, someone who follows an authoritarian system of social repression, all policy dictates derive from an individual, and all of society is viewed as his personal fief. Kaunda was building the image of this new emerging country around his own, and he couldn't accomplish that if there was another figure of equal or even greater influence living on settlements by the edge of the villages. Lanchina was certain that removing herself from the violence would keep her and her followers safe. But UNIP members found their settlements and kept attacking them at any opportunity they got. Only this time, the Lumba Church started to attack back. Members of the Lumba Church had started to grow tired of the constant attacks on their church. Against Lanchina's wishes to avoid direct confrontation, they started to fight back against the physical attacks and verbal aggressions of UNIP members. But instead of making the UNIP back off, these counterattacks only made them appear like a bigger, more dangerous threat that needed to be contained. As the clashes between the UNIP and the Lumpa Church began to grow more violent and constant, newly appointed Prime Minister Kaunda, along with the little support of the British government that was left at the time, gave the Lumpa settlements a deadline to relocate back to their villages. Lanchina refused to move back to a place where they would be even more heavily prosecuted and decided to ignore the ultimatum. When the deadline came and the Lumpa Church refused to leave, Kenneth Kaunda ordered the immediate annihilation of their settlements. On the morning of July 30th, 1964, a group of Zambian soldiers, along with members of the British Army that had remained in the country, marched into the Lumpa settlements with automatic weapons. Since the new regime was so freshly established, most of the soldiers had received little to no training on how to operate weaponry or what standard police procedures to carry out. One of the district officers in charge of heading this march into the settlements, John Hanna, recounts his experiences that morning. Quote, we arrived at dawn. The troops were formed up in line on the outskirts of the village, and when they were ready, I went forward about 20 yards and spoke to the villagers through my loud hailer, explaining who I was and asking them to surrender. I could see a lot of people moving around in a furtive way, but there was no response. I went on for about 10 minutes, but as I seemed to be getting nowhere, I started walking back to the colonel who was standing on the back of his Land Rover. I knew that as soon as I handed over to him, I was in effect giving the authority to fire and to kill. At that moment, the Lanchina supporters who had been hiding in the long grass, a little way in front of the troops, holding home weapons and tools, suddenly rose up yelling Jericho, their war cry, and attacked. Initially there was considerable confusion. The line of troops wavered before the onslaught. But the company commanders gained control over the soldiers, and they gradually advanced into the village. After about 15 minutes, the colonel fired a red very cartridge, and the firing ceased." End quote. Approximately 100 people died in this initial encounter between the soldiers and the Lumpa members, who decided to make the first move in a failed attempt to catch their attackers by surprise. Lenchina was not involved in this confrontation at all. She was kept away somewhere safe by the men in her inner circle. Reportedly, she tried to turn herself into the police on several occasions, but was stopped by her husband Petros and other high deacons of the church. This is something that would weigh on her deeply for the rest of her life. As Lanchina stayed hidden, she could hear how outside the police moved further into the settlement and opened fire on the members of her church. 
An anonymous account from one of the surviving members describes that moment with great detail. Quote, we heard the sound of guns. We ran into houses to hide. Our friends were being shot. We heard others calling, come and see, your friends are dead. We ran up and down. We saw people shout, some dying. The guns the soldiers used started from ground level and then rose to treetops. Chickens died, goats died, and trees lost their leaves. We ran up and down. Old people were crying. There was confusion. We kept saying, God, what has happened? End quote. The police not only killed Lumpa members by gunshots, but many accounts recall them sexually abusing women and children before stabbing them with stakes and setting them on fire. Commander officers quickly lost control of their untrained soldiers and did not regain it until new state troops had to be called in for backup. This massacre was known as the Lumpa Uprising of 1964. When it came to a halt less than 24 hours later, the casualties had risen to nearly a thousand, though an exact death count could never be determined. Hundreds of Lumpa members died that day. Fewer than 10 government soldiers were killed or even injured. According to Officer Hanna's recounting of the event, they estimated that approximately 700 people had been killed by the time the affair was over. But it was impossible to determine an exact death toll. In the following days, there were reports that after the police left Chinsali, there were a number of similar incidents in other parts of the same districts, as well as Lundazi, where Lumpa members attacked the police station and stole weapons. The soldiers left Lenchina's settlements not even a day after they arrived, but the message had been made clear. Lenchina watched as the members of the community she had worked years to build had been massacred while she hid away. In that moment, she decided to take full responsibility for the actions and power of her church. So she went directly to the man who wanted her destroyed, ready to face the consequences. Our story will continue in a moment after a brief message. And now back to the story. On August 11, 1964, 12 days after the Lumpa uprising, nearly a thousand people dead in their settlement, Lenchina surrendered herself to the government. She was detained alongside her husband, Petros. Even though Prime Minister Kaunda had been eagerly calling for her capture and wanted her to be brought to him dead or alive, he never called for her to be tried in court. His mission had been accomplished. The power and influence of the Lumpa Church had been eradicated. Thousands of people were left without a place to go or a community to belong to anymore, left to their own devices in a country that hated them and was actively persecuting them. Those who did survive had to escape or remain in hiding, afraid to openly practice the religion. Kowinda never put Lanchina on trial for any crimes in a court of law. At the same time, Lenchina attributed the loss of control and heavy politicization of the Lumpa Church to the young radical members, most of them men, who used their religion to further their own political agendas. During her time in detainment, Lenchina would say, quote, They did not understand my teaching, in particular the immoral young men. They were too much occupied with politics, end quote. <laughs> After the news of the attack on the main settlement spread to other settlements, as well as small churches and communities around Zambia, the surviving members did not wait for the same thing to happen to them. It's estimated that after the Lumpa uprising in July of 1964, approximately 20,000 of Lanchina's followers escaped the country, most of them to the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. It's also estimated that an additional 2,000 Lumpa members were captured and killed in the subsequent years, either trying to escape the country or in other settlements across Zambia. But these statistics completely exclude people that suffered serious injuries during the attacks, or that died from starvation, sickness, or trauma on their journeys escaping Zambia, which was referred to by the church as the Lumpa Diaspora. 
Later that year, in 1964, Lenshina and Petros were moved to a minimum security level detainment facility in the Kalabo district, where they were kept as political prisoners for three years. The little supervision that the regime put onto them, knowing that she wasn't a real threat, allowed them to try an escape plan in October of 1967, but they were caught. They were put in maximum security jail for six months and then moved to a more contained and restricted facility in the Mkushi district. In May of 1970, six years after Zambia had officially become an independent state and the UNIP had established itself as the only ruling party with Prime Minister Kenneth Kaunda at its head, he ordered the destruction of the main Lumpa temple, the large Sione in Lanchina's home district, as a final act of eradication against the Lumpa Church. Lenchina remained in the detainment facility for five more years. During that period of time, her husband Petros passed away in 1972. She was released in December of 1975 to be put under house arrest, where she remained until her death three years later. Not much is known about Lenchina's last years, or what her state of mind was like during that time. Most of the massive following that she had amassed in such a short period of time had been brutally assassinated or had fled the country. After her escape attempt in 1967, she was kept under much stricter imprisonment, which allowed for very little outside contact. She didn't display any aggressive behavior and remained quiet and solitary for the remainder of her life. Queen Alice Lenchina Mulenga died on December 7, 1978, while still under house arrest. Her remains were buried in the altar of what remained of the Sione Church in her home village, which by then had been partially destroyed by the government. Most of the surviving members of the Lumpa Church, as well as Lenchina's remaining family members, were scattered across the country in hiding. It wouldn't be until years later that they would find their way back together and give the church a second life. Kenneth Kaunda's authoritarian regime in Zambia ended in 1991, almost 30 years after the UNIP took over the government and established him as the unopposed leader. This change of power, as well as the large span of time that had passed after the Lumpa uprising, allowed some of the surviving members of the Lumpa Church to reconstitute. People that had been living in exile in the Congo felt safety and reassurance to be able to come back to their home country. Two of Lenchina's surviving daughters, Elizabeth and Jennifer Ngandu, took over the direction of the new Lumpa Church. It was renamed the New Jerusalem Church, mainly to dispose of the baggage that the original name carried within the country. The New Jerusalem Church carried on with Lenchina's original beliefs and goals for humankind, and she's considered the founder and chief prophet of the religion. Lenchina's daughters established temples in Zambia, but followers that had chosen to remain outside the country also set up churches in other regions. During the three decades of Kenneth Kaunda's regime, most of the information regarding the Lumpa Church was either kept away from the public or spun in a defamatory way with propaganda-like tactics. They wanted to make sure they remained either eradicated completely from public consciousness or that the public was heavily prejudiced against them. The Lumpa Church never obtained official recognition as a religion from the government, even after it was dismantled. The history and ideology of the Lumpa were not taught in schools in Zambia, and they're not subjects in their national war narratives. The burnt churches and mass graves were not recognized as memory sites. The Lumpa had been efficiently erased from the national memory of Zambia. It wasn't until May of 1993, 20 years after Lenchina's death, that the Lumpa church was brought back into the public eye. The Zambia Daily Mail newspaper published a series of articles written by editor Philip Chirwa that covered the church and its erasure from the national narrative. In these articles, Chirwa attempts to find out what happened to the followers that survived the Lumpa uprising, and in which ways the huge outreach that the Lumpa church had at its peak had stayed with the people of Zambia. It also followed the New Jerusalem church, as it tried to regain some of the influence that Lenchina once had. 
Another article came out in 2008, published by The Sunday Lifestyle, featuring an interview with Maggie Kasungami Mfula, who was Lenshina's personal assistant in the Lumba Church, as well as the overseer for the exiled followers in the Congo. In the interview, she explains how life turned around for them after the uprising, and how they were constant targets for persecution, even years after the dissolution of the church. Mfula said, quote, We have never had an opportunity to explain ourselves out of this tarnished image that has been associated with our organization, the Lumpa Church. It is hard for us to start from somewhere because our image has been tarnished badly. We have tried to talk to those in leadership, but they also just answered us badly. Our sources of wealth were grabbed from us, and all the riches we had have been taken." End quote. However, both of these publications did very little to reinstate the Lumpa Church as an essential part of the Zambian national history. Even though the Lumpa Church became one of the most powerful organizations not only in Zambia, but in the entirety of Africa during the middle of the 20th century, its history has been mostly forgotten and erased by a one-party state who felt threatened by it from the very beginning. The church still has some adamant followers under its new name, but it's unlikely to ever regain the outreach and influence that it once had. The Lumpa Church was allowed to flourish because of a combination of political turmoil, a national search for new ideological beliefs, and an ordinary village woman with the force and conviction to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people into using their own culture for change. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. Some of you have asked how you can help the show. If you enjoy Cults, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. You can find Cults and all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast directory. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Paul Liebeskind, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro, Paul Mahler, Maggie Admire, and Carly Madden. Cults is written by Jorge Molina and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. And here it is, your preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess Athena. I hope you like it. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycolos. Athena had a divine, godly strength, Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. 
Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday, we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today, we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of ParCast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At ParCast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram, at ParCast, and Twitter, at ParCast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine. And this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache. And Zeus's son, Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. 
And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, Oh, headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Make it stop. End it. Cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet, because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, there is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! (laughs) Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like Pallas to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The proud fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. 
She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you... She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. Getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.